Hi everyone, my name is Mr Barlow and welcome to episode 7 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 1, Area of Study 2, and in particular I'll be talking about the nu- nutritional requirements of heterotrophs, digestion and digestive systems. So this chapter is mainly about heterotrophs. And heterotrophs are organisms that cannot make organic molecules from inorganic molecules. So basically, living things have to have organic molecules to survive. So what heterotrophs do is they eat other organisms so that they can get all of their nutritional requirements. They either eat uh, autotrophs, which make their own organic material, or they eat other heterotrophs. So heterotrophs have several nutritional requirements. Um, basically, they need to have carbohydrates, uh, so that's uh, simple simple carbohydrates like glucose, um, and they actually store complex carbohydrates in a form of a polysaccharide called glycogen. So glucose is a monosaccharide, and glycogen is a polysaccharide. So heterotrophs also need to eat lipids. So lipids are fats. Um, lipids are really important um, for they compose the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, heterotrophs also need to eat amino acids. So amino acids are really important for building protein. And there are in fact 20 uh, different amino acids in total. But animals can actually only make 11 of the amino acids. So there's nine that they can't make and they're called essential amino acids. And they're the amino acids that animals have to eat or they have to consume from some other source, from eating plants or animals. Heterotrophs also need vitamins and minerals. Mammals actually need to consume 13 different types of vitamins and 20 uh, different minerals. So these are all required. So if animals don't get their um, what they need, their nutritional requirements, then they can actually get a um, deficiency disease, so some sort of nutritional dis- deficiency disease. So for example, if you don't eat enough vitamin C, uh, and this actually happened hundreds of years ago when people used to fin- spend a fair bit of time at sea and they couldn't grow uh, any oranges. You get a disease called scurvy. And there's heaps of nutritional deficiency diseases. So it's really important to make sure that you eat all of the things that you need to eat. Now, that was a cow. And you can eat cow if you like. Cows are a really good source of amino acids, which you need for proteins. But that brings up a bit of a question. So if you eat a really big chunk of cow, like a steak, and your cells are really, really small, how do you get the really big chunk of cow into your really, really tiny cells? And that's where digestion comes in. So digestion is basically the breaking down of large molecules into smaller ones so they can pass through the plasma membrane of cells. Now there are two types of digestion. The first one is chemical digestion. And what happens then basically is enzymes break down the large molecules into smaller ones. So if you eat carbohydrates, proteins and lipids, different types, so very specific enzymes, break down the different things. So there are three main groups of enzymes. There are amylases, and those break down carbohydrates. Proteases break down proteins and lipases break down lipids. So it's a bit easy to remember. Lipases break down lipids, LL. Proteases break down proteins, PP. And the only other one left, amylases break down carbohydrates. So different enzymes, in fact, um, so enzymes are proteins, but so different enzymes work best at different conditions. So for example, different types of enzymes work best at different pH levels. So pH tells you how acidic or basic something is. So for example, your mouth is not very acidic, but your stomach is really quite acidic. And different enzymes are released at different parts of the digestive system. So for example, enzymes that work best in in acidic environments are released in the stomach. And enzymes that don't work very well at all when it's acidic and maybe are denatured in acidic uh, conditions may be released in the mouth or maybe in the small intestine. So something I alluded to there is that um, I keep saying released. Enzymes were released. 
And that's because animals rely on what's called extracellular digestion. So what happens there is enzymes and digestive juices are released from cells into special cav cavities like the stomach, and that's where digestion takes place. So digestion doesn't take place inside the cells, it takes place outside of the cells, and that's why it's called extracellular digestion. Some invertebrates uh, do use intracellular digestion, so they get the, their food inside their cells and they do that via endocytosis. And then those nu nutrients are digested inside the cell. So that would be intracellular digestion. So that's chemical digestion. Another type of uh, digestion is physical digestion. And in physical or mechanical digestion, basically the food is physically broken up. And the main way that this happens in humans is by your teeth. So you physically grind up, um, grind up the um, food in your mouth. So you physically digest it. Your stomach muscles also churn, the muscles of your stomach also churn the food around. So they also do some physical digestion. So chemical digestion is with enzymes. And physical or mechanical digestion is digestion uh, using uh, your teeth or your muscles. So different animals have different digestive systems. And they're different depending on what they eat. So if you're a herbivore and all you eat is plants, your digestive system will be different to a carnivore because carnivores only eat meat. And their digestive system will be different again from an omnivore. And omnivores eat both plants and meat. So the first digestive system I'll talk about is the human digestive system, and we're omnivores. So maybe I'll tell you a bit about that uh, piece of cow that we ate earlier. And I'll tell you about the path that that piece of cow would take all the way through the digestive system. So the first thing is you put it in your mouth and you go, mmm, delicious steak. And your teeth grind it up via physical digestion, and your mouth releases saliva, which helps to lubricate the food. And there's also some amylase in saliva, so that helps to start uh, chemically breaking down any carbohydrates that are present. And then you swallow the bit of steak, and the bit of steak goes down your esophagus, which is a tube to your stomach, and it goes down via a process called peristalsis. And that's basically a series of muscular contractions in your esophagus, and they squeeze the food all the way down to your stomach. So once the food gets to the stomach, the food is then stored, uh, and it's called chyme in the stomach, so it's this semi-liquidy kind of stuff. And in the stomach, hydrochloric acid is released, and so is pepsin and gastric lipase, so they're a couple of enzymes, and they start digesting the proteins and fats. Fortunately, though, we're actually designed, or we've evolved very well. So our stomachs have actually got this mucousy stuff that's released on the stomach wall, and that protects our bodies from being digested from the inside out. So hydrochloric acid sounds pretty bad and all these digestive juices in you, um, but fortunately they don't digest the person that ate the bit of steak. So that's very convenient. So after it's been digested a bit in the stomach and the stomach's churned it around a bit, so there's been some chemical digestion and mechanical digestion, it passes into the small intestine, and the small intestine is an organ which does um, a lot of digestion, but also a lot of absorption of nutrients. So because it absorbs a lot of stuff, it needs to have a really high surface area to volume ratio, and it does that by having these fine little hair-like projections, and these are called villi. And the villi, in fact, are covered in even small little hair-like protrusions, and they're called microvilli. And that enormous surface area to volume ratio that that creates enables your um, small intestine to absorb material really efficiently. So the other thing that happens in the small intestine, and in fact this, the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum, is that some other enzymes are released to help finish digestion, and a substance called bile is released. So bile is released to neutralize the pH of the, you know, the chyme, or the stuff from the stomach, when it enters the small intestine. So it was really acidic in the stomach, but it needs to be not acidic in the small intestine, and so bile helps to neutralize the acid. 
So the food, or the steak, or whatever's left of it, travels to the ileum, which is the second part of the small intestine. And again, more nutrients are absorbed, mainly via active transport, and water is also absorbed via osmosis. So the, the last step in the process is, well, whatever's left goes to the colon and the rectum, and there's no chemical digestion here. Salt and water are reabsorbed back into the body, and there's actually a lot of bacteria in your colon, and that also helps to digest the fiber that's there. So the rectum then stores the poo or the feces, and after it's been stored for a while, you then will feel like going to the toilet, and you'll then go and ingest your poo. <laughs> So I said ingest your poo, not excrete your poo, because if food is uh, ingested and travels through the entire di digestive system and, and then is excreted again as feces, it's called ingestion. So that's stuff that's never been a part of your body. On the other hand, excretion refers to the removal of substances that were once part of your body. So it's things like... Um, when your cells you know, perform cellular respiration, one of the waste products is carbon dioxide, and you then <sighs> excrete carbon dioxide. Um, you also excrete nitrogenous wastes in your urine. So I've gone through digestion in mammals, but digestion works a little bit different in herbivores. So that's because herbivores eat a whole bunch of plants and plants are made up of, well, they've got lots of cellulose in them. So cellulose is a, uh, a complex carbohydrate. It's a polysaccharide. Um, and it actually makes up the plant's cell walls. But mammals can't digest cellulose. And in fact, herbivores by themselves can't digest cellulose by themselves either. So what they do is they enlist the help of some bacteria, which live in their digestive systems. And the bacteria release an enzyme called cellulase, and that can break down the cellulose. So that actually happens um, by a process called fermentation. So there's two ways the fermentation can happen. Either it can happen in the organ called the casum, which is, which is joined onto the large intestine, so it's after the stomach. And those organisms are called hindgut fermenters, which means after the stomach. So the other way that fermentation can happen is it can happen before the stomach and those herbivores are called foregut fermenters, which means before the stomach. So cows are an example of a foregut fermenter. They, along with other ruminants uh, like sheep, have a fermentation chamber which is found before the stomach, so that's why they're called foregut fermenters. Um, and their fermentation chamber is called the rumen, and that's why they're called ruminants. But wait a second. I thought we ate that cow earlier. <laughs> anyway, moving right along. After mammals have eaten their food, they store it somewhere. And then when they need to access their food stores because they need some energy to do something, they access their food stores in a particular order. So the first thing they access is their carbohydrate stores. And that's stored in the liver and their muscles. The next thing they access if they need energy is their fat storage, which is stored in adipose tissue or fat tissue. And the last source of energy they can access is proteins, and that's stored in body tissues. So um, basically, if your body starts to use up its protein stores, you pretty much need to be eating more. And that brings episode 7 of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thanks for listening.